Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, take them and open them, please, to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 19. We are back in Matthew's Gospel after taking a break for the last several weeks as we work through our short little series on earthly suffering and future hope. But this morning we are back in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are going to be focusing on a subject that I think probably is not preached about very often within churches, but it's where we're at in Matthew's Gospel, and that is the subject of divorce. But we're not just going to be focusing on divorce. What we're actually going to be focusing on is marriage. And to be more specific, the title of this morning's sermon is Godly Marriages, the Means by Which God Builds His Kingdom. It's the means by which God builds his church. It's the means by which God actually helps us to fulfill the Great Commission. So we're not just focusing on divorce, but on marriage as well. And of course, there are some who are not married. And so believe it or not, we're also going to focus a little bit on singleness. But the idea of this text, the main idea that we need to see here this morning is that whatever our station, whatever our lot, in life. It has been decreed by God, and it is to be lived out for the glory of God. So if you're there in Matthew chapter 19, and if you're able, please stand with me once more for the reverence of the reading of God's word. We're going to be looking from verse 1 down to verse number 12. Matthew 19, 1, the word of the Lord reads, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Thus ends this reading of the holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word of the living God. Receive it as such, and let's go to the Lord once more in prayer together. Father, as we come before you today, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your covenant of marriage, which you have gifted to us as men and women. We thank you especially for the covenant that exists between us and you and Christ, and that the church is in fact the bride of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have prepared for us a divine marriage supper, which all of us who are in Christ are called to feast in. Father, we do thank you also for all of those godly marriages that are represented here within the church. But Father, as we look at this text, we also see that there are some important teachings regarding not only marriage, but divorce and singleness as well. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each and every single one of us here this morning through your word, and that you would teach us the clear reality that wherever we are in this life, we are to live unto your glory. We are to live for your praise, and we are to worship you in all things. But at the same time, help us to see that marriage is a God-given covenant, institution, through which you are building your church and your kingdom. And so as you speak to us through your word this morning, help us to hold marriage in high honor again for your glory. Be with us, we pray, O Lord, for it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So the flourishing 
of the home, the church, and the state depends upon godly marriages. God has designed this world in such a way that the spread of the gospel and the expanse of his kingdom absolutely depends upon godly men and women becoming godly husbands and wives, becoming then godly fathers and mothers who raise godly sons and daughters. And from there, the cycle continues to repeat. And from within that, God is actually transmitting the truth of his word to future generations. And not only is he transmitting the truth of his word to future generations, he is also building his kingdom. And he is saving sinners. And the kingdom is expanding further and further and further. And the reason we know this is true is because when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them the dominion mandate. In Genesis 1.28, we read that the Lord blessed them, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now that commandment, the dominion mandate, you will notice being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, and then subduing it, it depends upon what? The union of a godly man and woman. And so here's, here's the good news about where the United States sees itself in the 21st century. I'm going to give you the good news first and the bad news, all right? Good news first. Divorce rates are actually decreasing. That's good, right? Here's the bad news. Marriage rates are also decreasing, and that's why the divorce rates are decreasing. See, sexual immorality has had a long-standing plague over not only our nation, but over the West as a whole. And we could point to a lot of different things. A lot of people would point to the 1960s and the sexual revolution. They would point to the rise of rampant feminism, and they would point also to all of these different issues that have been popping up over the last few decades with the LGBTQ plus agenda. Whatever the case, I think a case could actually be made that it goes back to the 1800s, but regardless, sexual immorality has been a problem for, I would argue, centuries now in the West, not just merely decades For decades, we've been able to see how big of a problem it's become, but the problem at its root is sin. And not just sin, but it's the fact that we don't hold marriage in the high honor that it deserves. And so that's why you constantly hear stories of illicit love affairs, and you hear about adultery, and you hear about marriages ending in divorce. And one of the things that absolutely kills me is when I hear people, young people, getting married, and then they jokingly say, well, I'm probably just going to end up divorced anyway. You know, my parents were divorced, and eventually I'll grow tired of this spouse, and we'll just get divorced, and I'll, I'll move on to the next one. See, not only is that sad and pitiful, it's actually abundantly sinful according to what scripture has to say. And so today in the United States, the divorce rate, if you're wondering, stands at around 42%. And to put that into perspective for you, that means that there are happening about 86 divorces every single hour. I checked the math on that, and apparently that's true. 86 divorces every single hour. 86 broken homes every single hour. Countless children being raised by broken families where the mother and father, they live apart, they're being remarried. And then we've got a whole other issue to throw into this, and that's the LGBTQ plus agenda. So I did a little bit of research, and as of 2021, I couldn't find updated for 24, it said that there were 711,129 same-sex marriages reported in the United States of America. I can only assume that number has gone up. I wouldn't be surprised if it's well over a million by this point, over a million same-sex marriages. Now, I will say 
marriage because it was instituted by God as a covenant between man and woman. I don't believe those marriages are true. I don't believe those marriages are represented by God. I don't believe those marriages are recognized by God, regardless, even if they're trying to say that they're Christians, they're, they're not. This is utterly sinful. It is shameful. It is an abomination. But on top of that, what we have to keep in mind is that in these same-sex, quote-unquote, marriages, many of them are now adopting children. And as they're adopting children, they're raising these children in a household where they either have two daddies or they got two mommies. And that is a huge problem because Scripture is clear that what a child needs to really learn, to grow, and to flourish is yes, a godly education. They need to be taught the Bible. They need to be brought to church, but they need a dad and a mom. They need both. And so we've got a serious problem in the West, in the United States. Really, it's a problem that is spread across the world. And the only answer, the only solution is scripture. Scripture's teaching on marriage and more specifically, what Jesus teaches us here about marriage and how godly marriages are required for the flourishing of not just humanity, but the spread of God's kingdom. And so here within this text, what we see in the first few verses is really an antagonistic driving force that we see permeating even our culture today. As the Pharisees come to Jesus and they question him about the Bible's teaching on sexuality, we can actually see much of our culture today because they have their own idea of how things are and then we have the truth. And we see that puts us at odds with them. That makes us enemies with the world. But as Jesus continues in this text, what we find out is not only must we be willing to stand for the truth of biblical sexuality, but we find out that biblical marriages are a good thing. And we find out that divorce is a bad thing. And not only is it a bad thing, but we find out that there's really only one instance where divorce is permitted in God's sight. And then we find out once more, as I've said a few times, Whatever our lot, whatever our situation, we are to live it under the glory of God. But to understand this, we need to begin with these first few verses in verses 1 through 3. And it's in the, these verses that we see, number one, miraculous healings and hostile questioning. Miraculous healings and hostile questioning. Verses 1 through 3. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, as you're reading the text, this is one of those situations where you look at the Pharisees, you look at what Jesus is doing, you look at the question that they're asking, and you almost have to say, what in the world does this have to do with the price of tea in China? This is totally out there, it seems like. Like, it's got nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about. But the reality is if you ever want to figure out what a buzzkill is, people that just want to tear down other people's joy, here you can look at the Pharisees. They're the buzzkill in the room. Because what has happened is Jesus has continued on his missionary journey, and large crowds are continuing to follow him. And it's clear that Jesus is popular amongst the people. And the reason he's so popular is because he teaches as one having authority, not like the scribes, not like the Pharisees. And on top of that, the Pharisees want the praise of the people. But they know the Bible says that only God deserves praise and worship. And it's clear that Jesus is God. Through all of these miracles, through all of these healings, it has become abundantly obvious that he is the Christ and he is the Messiah. And they're kind of losing their ground. They're losing their footing. They don't have a leg to stand on anymore. And so they think to themselves, how can we trip Jesus up? How can we ensnare him? How can we make him look bad in front of the people? Because we can't call his deity into question. We can't call his teaching into question. It's clear God is with him. What can we do? And they think to themselves, ah, here's what we'll do. We'll bring up marriage. We'll bring up sexuality. 
and we have our own preconceived notions and ideas, and we're going to see where Jesus goes astray from us. And then we're going to make him look like a bad guy. We're going to ask him a loaded question so that we can then get him into one of those gotcha sort of moments where we can say to everybody, see, look, he's against God's law. See, look, he doesn't understand what marriage is about. Now, what's important here is that this sort of accusatorial questioning is something that we as Christians are going to experience a lot going forward. Because again, I think that you can make a contrast here between the Pharisees and their questioning and how our culture today will often question us on what the Bible has to say about biblical sexuality. And what I mean by this is the Pharisees are going to Jesus and they're saying, is it ever permitted? Is it ever lawful for a man to divorce his wife? But actually what they're asking is, can they divorce their wives for any reason at all? It's a loaded question. It's a gotcha moment. People try to do the same thing to us today, especially within the LGBTQ plus movement. They'll say, isn't love, love? What do you think, Christian? Isn't love, love? Shouldn't you love those who sin? Shouldn't you love the homosexual? Well, if you should love the homosexual, shouldn't you agree with what the homosexual is doing? And if you don't agree with what the homosexual is doing, maybe you don't love them. And if you don't love them, that's not very Christ-like, is it? And they love to throw all of these loaded questions our way. But the truth is that we need to be like Jesus because those are questions designed to not only make us look bad, but to ensnare us and to trip us up. And what we need to do is what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16, be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. In other words, think through what you're saying. Think through the questioning. Don't let them lead the conversation because you have the truth of God's word on your side. Don't be a jerk about it. Be innocent as doves. Speak graciously, speak lovingly, speak with peace in mind, but still speak the truth. Speak the truth in love, yes, but speak the truth and do so boldly, do so confidently, do so courageously, knowing that this word is true and it's right and it's good and it's beautiful no matter what the world wants to call it we need to stand upon scripture as jesus says in another place there needs to be a certain amount of shrewdness within us when it comes to answering our opponents and our enemies and you notice that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus is able to silence his adversaries in this text. And really all he does is quote scripture and explain scripture's teaching on biblical marriage. That's all he does. And it silences his opponents. And so there's two things that we need to learn here in this section. The first is this. Whenever you are questioned in a hostile way, don't fear don't fret, don't worry about your opponents or your enemies, but stand boldly upon the word of God, just like Jesus did when he talked about biblical sexuality. And then secondly, even when it seems like everything is falling apart and everybody has abandoned this God-given directive for marriage, again, don't fear, don't falter. Because the kingdom of God is growing and it is expanding and there will eventually come a point, there will come a day when godly marriages, just like the glory of God, are going to cover this earth. This will happen. It's absolutely certain. So you may as well just be on the winning side now. So even when biblical marriages are under attack, remember the words of Calvin who said this, doubtless. Were we to regard things as they appear, the kingdom of Christ would seem often to be on the verge of ruin. But the promise that Christ shall never be thrust from his seat takes away from us every fear, for he will lay prostrate all his enemies. These two things then ought to be borne in mind, that the kingdom of Christ shall never in this world be at rest, 
but there will always be many enemies by whom it will be disturbed. And secondly, that whatever its enemies may do, they shall never prevail. So as we look at Jesus in this text, we see what we ought to expect in our lives. We will be attacked for standing for the truth of the gospel. We will be attacked for standing for the truth of biblical marriage. And yet, nonetheless, we will never be defeated. Because Christ will never be defeated and his kingdom will continue to expand forever until Jesus returns. And so with that in mind, we need to see then what marriage is all about. And so in verses four through six, we see number two, the biblical foundations for marriage. The biblical foundations for marriage. Verses four through six. He answered, have you not read? And remember the question, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? The answer is no, not for any reason. But this is why Jesus begins here. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. But therefore God is joined together. Let not man separate. So he's been asked about divorce, but he begins by speaking about marriage. And that's because marriage is really at the heart of the issue here. The Pharisees are thinking, when can we divorce our wives? Is there, can we do it for any reason, any reason at all? And Jesus is saying, no, not for any reason. The problem is that you don't understand what marriage is about. So let's go back to the beginning and let's go back to Genesis and see what God designed marriage to be. And so he appeals, first of all, and you guys know this, but I need to point it out anyway. He appeals, first of all, to the fact that when God created Male and female, he made only male and female. Nothing else. That's it. Male and female. That's, that's all God made. And when God designed the sexes, he designed them for a very particular purpose and for a very particular reason. People have joked it was not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve and I know that that sounds funny, but it's actually incredibly true. And it matters. Because if Adam could have had Steve be his helpmeet, then God would have did that. But it couldn't be Adam and Steve. It had to be Adam and Eve, male and female. He created them. So that's the very first thing you need to see about what Jesus is doing here as he begins to biblically define what marriage is and what the design of marriage is about. He shows us in the creation, God made male and female for a particular purpose and for a particular reason. And here's an important fact. You can't change what you are. No matter what surgeries are used, no matter what sort of mental gymnastics are going on, you can't change what you fundamentally are. Even if the Olympics says it's okay for a man to compete in a boxing match with a woman, actually, no. I don't even think women should be in boxing matches anyway, but I'm hot take Jake over here, just upsetting people anyway. But here's the point. You can't change what you fundamentally are. You were created by God to be the gender you are, and you can't change it. We see this also, by the way, in Jeremiah 1.5. God is speaking to the prophet and he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. You know what we're told in that text? That God, before we were born, ordained whether we would be male or female. Likewise, Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16 say this. You, God, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them. So in other words, not only does God design us within 
the womb of our mothers, but God actually designates from eternity past what we're going to be, who we're going to be. And we can't change that. There's no changing that. But we must accept whether male or female, God has created us to be this for a reason and for a purpose. The reason being, it's going to most glorify him. And so to follow him and obey him means accepting this is what he has made us to glorify him. Now, we also need to know, not only does he make them male and female, but the other thing Jesus is doing here is he's quoting from Genesis 2. And that matters because in Genesis 2, for most of the chapter, Eve is not there. What you have is Adam. And Adam is being led around by God and God specifically says, Adam needs a helper. And something amazing happens in that text. Genesis 2, 18 to 20. The Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So it's almost sick that I even have to say this today, but Adam is brought to all of the animals and they find out none of these animals can be a companion for Adam. So bestiality, sinful. The horse cannot be a companion for Adam. The dog, maybe man's best friend, can't be a lifelong companion for Adam. Adam needs something else. And as it turns out, it can't be another man either. It needs to be something else. So Adam is brought throughout all of the creation. He finds out all of these different things. They're not a fit helper. And so God is about to institute the covenant of marriage. And to do this, Eve is required. If man's going to fulfill his mission of taking dominion of the earth, glorifying God, keeping the garden, working the garden, expanding the Garden of Eden throughout the whole earth, he needs a woman. And so in Genesis 2, 21 to 22, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. This woman is the only suitable helper for the man. And that's why, and this is what Jesus is quoting then, Genesis 2, 23 and 24, the man sees her and he said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called women, woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So by appealing to this record, In Matthew 19, Jesus is telling us this is still the way it is. Only one man, one woman, brought together in holy marriage, they are made one. And there is nothing then that should separate them or bring them apart. And you should not seek to separate this union. This means then that the only God-approved, God-recognized marriage is the marriage between one man and one woman. I don't care what our government says. All of these supposed same-sex marriages, they are not recognized or approved by God. They're false. And there's many other marriages too that are like this. And we could spend a whole lot of time talking about how people are now, this is true apparently, they're trying to marry their dogs. People are trying to marry stuffed animals. Horrible things are happening. Crazy things are happening. But this is the only God-approved, God-recognized marriage between one man and one woman. What this means then is that Jesus, despite what so many try to say, Jesus did speak against homosexuality. He did speak against transgenderism. He spoke against the whole LGBTQ plus agenda, and he did it right here in Matthew 19. One man, one woman, that's it. There's no other God-recognized marriage. And it's within this covenant of marriage then that the man and woman are brought together and they are made one and there's nothing that can separate them. And their mission now is to go forth and to take dominion of the earth. And the way through which dominion is taken today 
is through the proclamation of the gospel, through the great commission. And as disciples are made, even within the home, dominion is being taken. The question then becomes, no, you can't divorce your wife or your husband for any reason, but is there ever a biblical warrant for it? And Jesus is going to tell us, yes, but only one. And so thirdly, in verses seven and nine, we see the biblical warrant for divorce. The biblical warrant for divorce. Before I read this text, allow me to remind you that throughout the Old Testament, we see God in covenant with Israel. And he calls Israel his bride. But you find out that Israel, the nation, is unfaithful to God in this covenant. And so eventually, God in the prophets uses the language that he is divorcing his bride, Israel, because of her unfaithfulness. So with that in mind, look at what Jesus says in verses 7 to 9. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? So they've asked, can you divorce your wife for any reason? Jesus says, no, what man, God has joined together. Don't let man separate. They say, well, when can we then? He says in verse eight, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, <clears throat> it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So since I've probably already insulted half the world so far with the stuff I've said this morning, let's just go for the other half too while we're at it. Although we talk about no-fault divorce today, although we have this concept that you can sort of divorce your spouse, you know, if they, they don't clean up after themselves or they make you angry or they upset you, or you just kind of grow tired of them. The Bible says that is utterly sinful, and there is only one way, only one time, I mean, in which you can divorce your spouse where it becomes permissible, and that is in the case of sexual immorality or adultery. Now, did Moses say this was okay? Yes. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, there are directions given, and it's the exact thing that Jesus says here. When sexual immorality is committed, divorce is then permissible. Only, and this is interesting, we read in verse number three and four, if the man divorces his wife, he sends her out, and she gets remarried, and the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away and divorced her may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring that sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. We'll deal with that in just a moment. First thing I want to point out, divorce is permitted by God in cases of sexual immorality. It's not commanded. That's an important distinction to make. It is permitted and it is acceptable, but it is not commanded. One of, I think, the most powerful testimonies that I've seen, a few years ago I, I was counseling this married couple through an issue just like this. One of the spouses was unfaithful. There was a case of adultery. And the faithful spouse had every right. They were in right standing, it was acceptable and it was permissible for them to divorce their unfaithful spouse. But the one who had remained faithful said, I will not divorce them because not only do I love them, but because of the grace and mercy that God has shown to me, how could I possibly now withhold forgiveness in our marriage from this individual? And I thought, that's, that's not, all, that not, not only does that take incredible power and strength and a genuine love to do, but it is a great example of the love, the faithfulness, the grace, and the mercy that God shows to us. Because imagine if every time we sin, God said, all right, that's it, divorce. But that's not what God does. God remains faithful to us even when we are unfaithful to him. That, 
that entire story was just an amazing example to me of the grace and mercy that God shows us as we stand in covenant with him. Now, in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, there was no divorce because there was no sin. But after Adam and Eve sinned and they broke covenant with God, it was clear they could actually break covenant now with one another. And so God makes it permissible to divorce, but only, only, mark this, only in the case of sexual immorality. The question then becomes, and this is an important question, can the divorced ever remarry? And the answer is they're permitted to, but they are not commanded to. But if they are going to remarry, so the one who was faithful in the, re, in the marriage, they may remarry the one whom they divorced so long as that person doesn't remarry. If the unfaithful divorcee remarries, they're off the table. They can't be remarried again. But at the same time, the one who was faithful, if they're seeking to be remarried, then there's a requirement here. The requirement is the same for every single person, by the way, who's a Christian you must marry another Christian. That is a requirement. I think a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble would be avoided within the church if we just simply followed this. Every Christian must marry another Christian. If they're not a Christian, don't even start a relationship with them. It's a terrible idea. A lot of people have this idea, I can fix them, I love, no, you can't. Only God can. And until they're fixed, until they're saved by God, you cannot enter a relationship with them. 2 Corinthians 6.14 clearly teaches, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So the one who divorces their spouse due to sexual immorality may remarry, but it has to be another Christian. And that Christian may not have been divorced due to sexual immorality. It's a very crystal clear requirement. It's not one that people like to see, but it is clearly here within scripture. But again, I wanna point out, to those who are divorced, to those who are unmarried, they are permitted to marry, but it is not a requirement. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11 puts it this way. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Now, even as I read that, I know many people are probably bothered by it, maybe even upset by it, and they go, that just doesn't seem fair, that doesn't seem right. The problem is, we don't hold marriage in as high esteem as we should. Hebrews 13, 4 says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So let's understand that what Jesus is doing in the entirety of this text is he is explaining to us in no uncertain terms, sexual immorality, which is a serious sin, happens whenever there are sexual relationships outside of the confines of one man, one woman, married. Outside of that, one man, one woman in marriage, everything else is a sin. Anything premarital, sinful. Anything between a man and a man, sinful. Anything between a woman and a woman, sinful even if they were claiming that they're married. Somebody unfaithful in the marriage covenant, sinful. That's sexual immorality. Someone is divorced and they go marry a non-Christian, sinful. Someone is divorced and they go marry someone who was divorced because they were unfaithful, sinful. And I know I say all of these things, but here's the reality we often don't believe them because our culture tells us not to. Our culture says all of these things are fine. They're hunky-dory. They're okay. If people are happy, just let them be happy. But that's not what the Bible says. And I know 
I get messages sometimes from people, and they'll say things like, why do you care what people do in the privacy of their own bedrooms? And the reason is because the Bible cares about this. Because the fate of the world hangs in the balance. It's that big of a deal. It matters. And if somebody is committing the sin of sexual immorality, whether within marriage or outside of marriage, then they must repent. This is not the unpardonable sin. It's not the unforgivable sin, but it is nonetheless a serious sin because scripture tells us no other sin so clearly impacts the body like sexual immorality. You can't say that you're joined to Christ, you're joined to God, and then go and commit sins like these. And so it's with all of that in mind, I want us to see that whether you're married here this morning or whether you are single here this morning, whether you are seeking marriage or you have no desire to be married, whatever the case, I want you to see, number four, both marriage and singleness are gifts from the Lord. Both marriage and singleness are gifts from the Lord. Verses 10 through 12. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. So basically, I'm not sure what's going on in the disciples' minds here, but they're saying, well, if there's only one reason that we can ever divorce our wives, maybe it's better not to be married, which doesn't seem to be the sort of thing you would want to say in front of your wife. But anyway, they say this, and Jesus responds. He said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. Very important distinction here in verse 11. When I say that singleness is a gift, it's not a normative gift. In other words, the church ought to seek to help those who are single to be married. And we ought to seek to support those who are in marriage. But there are people, few people, in comparison to those who ought to seek marriage, few people who are actually given the gift of singleness. And that's why in verse 12, Jesus says, for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, these are, these are men who can't ever be married. And he says, let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Now again, interesting text, but it's very straightforward and simple. The normative experience of every man and woman ought to be to seek marriage and to have godly offspring. That is the normative experience. But some, some are called to singleness. And for those who are called to singleness, they are to live their lives devoted to God and his kingdom. And this is a gift from the Lord. That's why 1 Corinthians 7, 6 to 9 says, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. Paul is writing. I wish that all were as, my, as I myself am. Paul was single. But each has his own gift from the Lord, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So again, Singleness is a gift from the Lord if they're actually called to it. Most, however, are called to marriage. And so within the covenant of marriage, we ought to seek to hold it in high honor. And within the covenant of marriage, although not everyone is able to have children, the normative experience ought to be to have children and to raise those children to be godly lights in a dark world. Now, if over the course of me saying all of this, you've been thinking to yourself, man, I've sinned in a lot of different ways. I've messed up a lot of different ways. This whole sexual immorality thing, this describes me. Remember, this is not the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. Rather, the one who is committing this sin must genuinely repent. And by repenting, that means not only seeking the forgiveness of God, it means actually turning away from the sin. And so that might mean a relationship needs to be broken off. That might mean that marriage just needs to happen and needs to be entered into. But whatever the case may be, we need to seek the face of God because Jesus Christ died for our sins. 
He rose from the dead for us so that by believing in him, we would be brought into covenant with him. And so on this earth, our marriages must, they must not only glorify God, but they must reflect the glory of the union that exists between the church and Christ because the church is the bride of Christ. And that's why in Ephesians 5, 22 to 32, I wanna read this in closing. This is what we read. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Beloved, Godly marriage doesn't just glorify God. It doesn't just help us take dominion of the earth and fulfill the great commission. Godly marriage is a blessing. It is a gift from the Lord. Sexual immorality, on the other hand, whether it's committed within marriage or outside of marriage, whatever form it may take, it is an abomination before the Lord. It is sinful. And so if that describes you, again, this is a call for you to repent because marriage is to be held in high honor amongst the saints and especially within the church. So let us seek to remain faithful, not only to our spouses, but especially to Christ and let us glorify him wherever the Lord has called us. Stand with me as we pray together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you again for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have explained to us what marriage is, what marriage is about. And even as you answer for us the question of when divorce is permissible, and even as you show us all of the different sorts of sexual immoral sins that can be committed, we thank you, O Lord, for the reminder that in Christ we have forgiveness of sin, we have salvation. And we thank you most of all for the union that we have with Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bless every marriage that is represented here today, every family that is represented here today, and even those who are unable to be with us today. I pray, Lord, that you would help husbands and wives to grow closer together and to draw closer to you. Help our children, O Lord, to closely follow you and help them to be able to look to our own marriages as an example of the union that exists between Christ and and his bride. Lord, I pray that you would make us faithful to you and help us to hold marriage in high honor. And we pray that you would receive glory for all of this. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.